to a brand new episode of I Dang Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfamenta. If this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, I welcome you and I hope that you return for future episodes and new content. If you are a returning viewer or listener of the podcast, I welcome you back and I hope that today's episode is one that you find informative, enlightening, and insightful. So before we get into the main conversation, I ask for folks who are on YouTube to hit that red subscribe button so you can get notifications on future episodes of our Dane Talk for Educators Live, as well as other visual content. It should be under my name, Kwame Sarfo Mensa. And for those who are listening, uh, you can subscribe to our Dane Talk for Educators Live podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other streaming platforms. Thank you kindly. Now, let's talk about today's episode. So we are talking about what it means to be an anti-bias, anti-racist educator. So for sure, Abar. So in education, we tend to get inundated with acronyms and abbreviations for all these sophisticated terms. So today is going to be another episode where we're really going to break down what one of these terms is. And this, in this case, we're talking about ABAR, anti-bias, anti-racist education, something that has emerged um, over the past couple of years. And we have an educator who is somebody who is well-versed when it comes to anti-bias, anti-racist education. She, she is someone that we all should know about if you are on social media, if you're an educator, if you're not following her, uh, you need to follow her. And it's an honor to, to have her on. So uh, without further ado, I want to bring on Liz Kleinrock to the podcast to talk to us about what it means to be an anti-bias, anti-racist educator, but also her own journey into becoming the person that she's still growing to be right now. So let's bring Liz on to have this conversation. Hey. Hello. Hey, hey. thanks so much for having me. If I had known this was also on YouTube, I probably would have put on makeup before this. <laughs> no, you are you are radiant right now. You are you are all right. I appreciate it. Also, if my bunnies make noise in the background, I just let me know and I will feed them or something. <laughs> Listen, here, we're not about perfectionism here. We we all about combating that white supremacy culture. So if something happens in the background, it's all good. It's not going to derail the conversation. <laughs> well, thank you again for inviting me on. I'm super excited to chat with you today. Yeah, awesome. So let's before we get into the main conversation let's talk about your upbringing so you've shared this story in other platforms so i know you know you were born in south korea you know being adopted by a white jewish family so we we know that much but talk to us about just your journey more specifically your socialization process as you were growing up and how did that ultimately get you to the education field? Oof, it's a good question. Um, so yes, I'm adopted. Um, I grew up as the only person of color and still like to this day, the only person of color in my like immediate and extended family. Um, and I think only now like in adulthood, I'm kind of like piecing together the experience of growing up as like the sole East Asian person in my immediate community because like the only other Korean people in my neighborhood like own the dry cleaners a couple blocks away. Um, there were like a handful of other Asian students in my grade at school, um, but were certainly not a lot. Um, and like what it means to be East Asian identifying growing up in like a white functioning white presenting Jewish family in a historically black city. Um, I grew up here in Washington, DC. Um, I actually attended a really uh, intense 
prestigious prep school from pre-kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. Um, so was in class with some of the same kids from like age four or five, like all the way till graduating high school. Um, I got a really amazing education in a lot of ways and also I think inherited some educational trauma in others um, because of how narrowly the idea of success was defined by the institution that I spent majority of my life in. Um, I felt incredibly unintelligent compared to a lot of my classmates and peers. Um, I think I really struggled in terms of like academic self-esteem and it really wasn't until going to college when I realized, wow, like I'm actually kind of smart, like I'm kind of good at this. Um, I don't know why, like I have been feeling the opposite for so much of my life. Um, and then further, I got into like teacher education and learning more about educational pedagogy. I started to realize that I had been taught in a very particular method uh, for my entire life and that it didn't really mesh well with who I am and how I think and how I process. Um, so I always try to remember those experiences and those feelings when I'm working with students who might be struggling in certain areas. Wow. And as you were talking about your educational self-esteem, I can remember a post you put up where you, you had your, I believe is your high school report card and it yep. had like all these bad grades on there. Right. And as you were doing that, I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, we have this model minority myth that happens where, you know, we expect, all Asians to be good academically, particularly in like the math and the sciences. So for you to put up that report card, I'm wondering at that particular time when you were having your academic struggles, did you feel like there were expectations from your teachers that, oh, you're supposed to be getting much better grades than that just because of your um, racial identity? Did you feel that pressure? coming from some of your teachers? Yeah, and it's very strange also when you grow up and don't know many, like I didn't really have like East Asian, um, like adults in my life or, you know, there's a lot more visibility now, I think in terms of like diverse books and histories. And there just wasn't a lot that, of that that I knew how to find at least when I was growing up. Um, so like, not only did I feel kind of like that I was letting my teachers down, like I was supposed to be able to achieve um, to a certain metric in a certain way. Um, but then in, in the media, when, you know, you have all these examples of like the model minority myth of Asians succeeding and excelling in like the STEM fields, and I just wasn't one of them, um, feeling like, oh gosh, like am I, I've been fed this single story, but I'm, am I not even living up to this stereotype? Um, and it, it seems like ridiculous now to look back and like try to hold myself up against something that is like harmful and also not true. Um, you know, I think it was just another example of how oftentimes like folks of color are set up to fail in these systems because we're held up to an expectation that is actually impossible to achieve. Um, so yeah. <laughs> but now in hindsight, when you see that report card, you now see it as an act of resistance because like I said, we talk so much about the studious Asian, the my minority myth. And for you to put that up there, it's like, you know what? I was not that person when I was in high school. So it just serves as evidence that, you know what? We don't, we're not all brilliant. We, you know, it's not something that's innate. Absolutely. You know what I mean? so, yeah, and also one sure. of Disvelis idea that grades have to hold so much weight that grades are going to be like some sort of indicator of like the success that you're going to find in life. Um, so I was also hoping by sharing that report card for folks who are students who might be going through like a similar time in their life to remember like whatever I'm dealing with now doesn't define me. Like I'm still going to be able to go on and achieve the things that I, you know, were that I'm passionate about, that I care about. Um, that, you know, this A, B, C, D, F scale, like it doesn't mean anything at all. 
And like in the work around like anti-bias and anti-racism, I think like grading for equity is such an important conversation that I think some schools are kind of like beginning to have, but people are also still very attached to this very antiquated way of grading, even if they can't explain necessarily why they're so attached to it, but just because it is the status quo, it is what is familiar. And I'm sure for a lot of folks trying to reimagine grading for equity, means that they have to think outside the box in a way that they've never had to before and how, I don't know, intimidating that can be for folks. But I think so much of this work requires the adults in the room to have to decenter themselves and like our own comfort and what we grew up with um, and to realize that if we are perpetuating systems that we know were harmful and didn't work for us, like why would we want to continue that with the young people in our lives? Absolutely. And let's shift gears because I want to talk about just add bar for a second, just that that term. Because when I first learned of the term, I learned from it from my good friend, uh, Francois uh, Deneau, who is oh, the Wolf Span on Instagram. <laughs> so, you know, Fran is my homie. I uh, love Fran. If you're not following Fran, please follow her, the Wolf Spanish teacher on Instagram. Learned so much from her. And that's when I learned about the term add bar. So, of course, you know, me being curious, I looked it up and I realized, okay, it means anti-bias, anti-racist. So here's what I'm wondering. In education, we have so many acronyms and so many abbreviations to describe basic concepts or common sense concepts, if you will. And we've had so much talk about anti-racism, this anti-racism, that. So what I'm wondering is when you add the anti-bias part to anti-racism, is that a way for us to be more inclusive of other groups, um, particularly LGBTQ plus community, um, our folks who may have disabilities and, and other groups who may not always be represented because in my mind, I'm thinking if you're talking about anti-racism, it's implied that you're also talking about those other groups. That's just me. And mm -hmm. I don't feel like you should have to add the anti-bias part. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about just the terminology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I shared something on this recently on Instagram. Um, and I'm glad that it resonated with a lot of folks. Um, but when I think about like, differentiating between anti-bias and anti-racism. I think of anti-bias as like the giant umbrella that actually anti-racism falls into because there are so many different types of bias out there. And um, I'll often joke that bias is like one of our strange like common denominators as people. Like it doesn't matter what your identity is, where you live, where you grew up. Like there are biases that like we all have about people, about communities that are different than us. Um, I do think that there are a lot of schools, companies, organizations that like to use words like anti-bias or, oh, wow, okay, you are well prepared. Um, the words that you'll see Do if you're like, watching <laughs> on the left side. So if you're talking about terms like diversity, equity, inclusion, cultural responsiveness, anti-bias, a lot of people like to use those words just to mean like we're talking about race, but we don't like to name race or racism because that makes us really uncomfortable. So we're just going to call it like DEI work instead. Um, but if you're really talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, being responsive to folks of different cultural backgrounds and identities and anti-bias work, there are all these other different identity markers, um, social identifiers that we have to bring into the conversation too and make sure that we're included. Um, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is amazing, um, coined the term intersectionality to talk about the ways in which our identity is constantly are at um, these intersections um, and impact the way that we experience oppression in our communities, but also impact the types of privileges and how you know easily we're able to navigate our communities in the world that we live in. So if you're talking about any of those terms I just listed, you have to also be um, aware of folks' ethnicities, languages, uh, gender identity, sexual orientations, uh, age, religion, uh, neurodiversity also. Um, and to recognize that it's also, you know, this ongoing work in progress, like at no point do you say, 
cool, I've like checked all the boxes. I am now an expert in all things a bar. Um, I can just like pack it up and go home for the day. Um, like the image that um, if you're watching that you can see on the screen here, it's divided um, in half and I was told by a friend who is disabled, actually, um, I had posted a different image the day before um, with a different color scheme and different fonts, even though the format is the same. Um, but he was just like, hey, just wanted to let you know, like for folks with visual impairments, like this post actually isn't inclusive. It's really hard to read. Um, and I so appreciated being called in by him. Um, and when I reposted it, I left up the original image um, just to show people like, cool, I did this. Clearly, like, I'm still very much in, like, the learning and unlearning process. Um, I really appreciate somebody for offering this correction, so that way I'm able to learn from it and also share that unlearning and relearning with all of you, too, because um, I do think, like, the accountability piece is also really crucial here. And yes, like, sometimes there are feelings of, like, shame or embarrassment where you're like, oh, crap, I totally did not mean to do that. But as always, it's about... Um, your impact over your intentions. Um, so yeah, there's there's always gonna be work to be done, but just to go back to the original question, to encourage folks, if you're using these like very large all encompassing words um, that exist within like the field of ABAR diversity work to really think about what that actually means and who needs to be included. Absolutely. And you're, you just mentioned this idea of accountability. So, this is a perfect opportunity to ask this question because in your book, uh, Start Here, Start Now, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, throughout the book, you talk about the importance of taking a restorative approach to anti-bias, anti-racist work. So as people of color, sometimes it's hard for us to, to engage with that because we have so much trauma that we deal with with that identity. And then also, because of the cumulative effect of that trauma, we find ourselves in situations where we engage in, you know, cancel culture where, oh, you're saying this about me? Nah, I'm not even trying to rock with you right now. So what I wanna know from you is, when is it appropriate to call somebody in versus call someone out, particularly within a school setting, since we're talking about educators here? Mm -hmm. It's such a good question. And for the book, when I write on this, I was really um, fortunate to have been able to interview Loretta Ross, who um, is a Black female scholar who has written quite a lot about um, calling in versus calling out and cancel culture and have just really appreciated being able to learn from her knowledge and expertise. Um, I personally think like in an educational setting, um, I try to go the calling in route as much as possible and especially when it comes to working with students. Um, I think that being able to use these moments where maybe something problematic is said or done, um, but be able to uh, catch those moments and use them as teachable opportunities um, for yourself, for your students, for your entire classroom communities um, to recognize that we make mistakes all the time. And quite frankly, I think, you know, my the majority of my work has been done in elementary schools, but it's kind of like one of the last opportunities, unfortunately, for kids to ask questions, to make those types of mistakes without like huge, potentially lifelong repercussions. Um, and yes, like I have definitely had students or colleagues say things to me that have triggered some sort of like past trauma based on my identity or experiences. And in those moments, it is really, really challenging sometimes to remember like, okay, right. Um, I'm not here to react in like a super inflammatory way. I want to make sure that I'm able to express what I'm feeling and what I need in this moment and to hold the person who has said or done something accountable also. Um, but in the book, I also have, um, I've told the story a couple of times about a student who had said something problematic in front of an entire class of peers um, and recognizing in that moment, like having to respond to it in a way that would 
meet the needs of students who were potentially harmed while making sure that the other students knew that this wasn't something to like laugh or joke about. And to also make sure that the student who actually said the thing in the first place would be able to continue participating in these conversations and wouldn't just shut down every time race would be mentioned going forward. Um, so I do think like as a classroom teacher, you do have to recognize you're juggling a lot of those things because um, then there are conversations you have to have to follow up with parents and caregivers and potentially let your administrators know like, hey, this was said in class. This is what I did. Just letting you know if somebody reaches out. Um, but like when you are in a community, then it's about community care too. Like it's about extending care for yourself to the people in your classroom, um, to their family extensions and things like that. Um, and it can be really, I think, often easier to just ignore when things are said or done, or it's easier to snap at someone and tell them to be quiet and like, you know, how dare you? And sometimes that, depending on the situation, that might be the right thing to do. Um, but I think without that, uh, underlying why, then chances are the behavior of the words or actions are just going to continue. And you, know, you mentioned how there are certain actions by your colleagues that may trigger some of that trauma that you've experienced in your own life, right? And you carry a heavy burden you know, doing this work, even writing this book you had to relive some pain, you had to relive some trauma just to even get through this book, I imagine. So what I'm wondering is, how are you able to set boundaries for yourself and maintain the momentum to still engage in the work while still addressing that trauma and in some cases your own racial battle fatigue being a Korean American woman? How do you navigate all that and still stay the course? It's hard. Um, and I think this is a place where I have grown a lot, but truthfully, I'm very much still growing in this area too. Um, I'm very thankful for my therapist. Um, she is great. And a lot of the work that we do in therapy centers um, around nonviolent communication, which is about like identifying what you feel and like what you need based on those feelings, if your needs are being met or not being met. Um, I think part of just getting older and doing this work for longer, I've just had to become more aware of where I'm putting my energy and where I am willing to put my time and energy. Um, and I will often tell, especially like white folks in this work, like if you're really trying to be an accomplice or a co-conspirator and if a person of color like calls you in and offers a correction, and that takes a lot of energy and it means that they actually care enough about you to want to preserve your relationship and like move forward together. Right. Um, because if I don't care about you, sometimes I might let things slide, but in my head, I'm just like, I will probably not be seeking out conversation with you or like seeking out your company going forward, um, which can be really hard. Um, I'm very grateful to have a partner who keeps me very accountable also. He is great at pointing out if I am like working too much, if there have been like too many evenings after work that I'm still continuing to like see clients or um, work on other projects. Um, I'm just trying to be really mindful of also just realizing that I am no good to anyone and I'm no good to my students. I'm no good to this work if I am burned out to the point where I can't take care of myself. Um, and also to resist, I think, some of those characteristics of white supremacy culture. And especially, I think, even teachers of color tend to internalize like the saviorism, the paternalism, and to realize that if even if I need to step away from what I'm doing for a couple of days or a week or even this entire summer, that everything is going to be fine. Like, like I need to also be able to trust the people in my community and not feel like, oh my gosh, if I am not here, if I'm not doing this, will all of this fall apart? No, it's not going to fall apart. It's going to be okay. Yeah, shout out to your partner for being your accountability partner because we we need that. I know my wife, you know, she tries to hold me accountable and lets me know when I'm doing the most. Uh, <laughs> you need to take you need to uh, step away from that screen for a second. Uh, you don't need to take this call right now. You know, give yourself some time to decompress. But here's something that I've noticed with regard to influencer culture and social media. And you can relate to this a lot more than I can. Um, 
there's this sense of urgency that exists. When we talk about white supremacy culture, particularly that sense of urgency, where you have a lot of white folks that they want prescriptions. They want yes. immediate results, immediate antidotes to these very complex interconnected issues. And it's just frustrating because when you mentioned this idea of allyship um, versus you know being a co-conspirator, part of it is understanding, and this is why I mentioned the folks, it's understanding that when you're engaged in this work, it requires you to be doing proactive and continuous capacity building, really. And that's reading books, listening to people. But the proactive part is where we tend to drop the ball, you know, sometimes because you have people that expect all the answers to be fed to us. So if speaking to white educators, what are some major steps that they can take to make that paradigm shift to get away from this performative allyship to becoming someone that's truly and genuinely engaged in anti-racism and anti-bias work? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, something that I talk about in like workshops and sessions that focus on like white white identity focus on white educators is reminding white folks to embrace this idea of yes and, and to try to reject binary thinking as much as possible. Um, because I think being able to be an effective accomplice or co-conspirator is not something that you get to, it's not a label you get to put on yourself. Um, I think there are a lot of folks who take the term ally and like to um, be like, cool, um, this is what I am, this is what I do. But folks in the community that are trying to be an ally with might be like, oh, actually like not so much. Um, to think about who is being centered. Um, are you following the lead of folks of color who have been engaged in this work probably far longer than you have as a white person? Um, it's not just about uh, using your power or privilege. It's really thinking about giving up like relinquishing and spending your power or privilege, um, which I think is one of the hardest steps, particularly for white folks in positions of power who actually have no interest in giving up any sort of institutional power or influence, um, but wanna be seen as like a good white person. Um, to go back to like that binary thinking piece, um, like being able to understand who you are, what kind of community you're a part of, your place in your community, the role you have in your community, um, because there are a lot of what I would consider like contradicting truths that white folks need to be able to hold at the same time. Um, like one, I think really common example is that in racial justice work, that folks mm -hmm. of the global majority need to be centered in that work. And at the same time, a school or organization cannot and should not expect folks of color to do all of the labor for them. Um, so being able to recognize like, oh, this is actually a time where I could step up and this is a time where I should actually step back. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's very essential, but it takes time for them to realize, an effort for them to realize, hey, I need to just recognize my positionality in this context and just take a step back. But there are also times where I need to utilize my power to intervene when I see that there is some um, racist activity taking place. Mm -hmm. So that that's a learning process you it know, is. in itself. Very much so. And like, again, that fine line between like, stepping into like, you know, spend their power of privilege, but not being a white savior at the same time, like that line can be really, really thin sometimes. Um, Cause I think like when white folks who are engaged in like anti-racist work see an injustice, like they wanna be able to like swoop in and like fix it to, sometimes it could be considered like virtue signaling, but like the need to act without considering like maybe this person actually doesn't want the attention or doesn't need your help or want your help. Um, and it's tough to navigate. 
I think, I mean, I think if you are considering how you can be an accomplice to any sort of like marginalized community that you're not a part of, like it's tough. Um, I think the best example of a white person being an accomplice or co-conspirator in my life, I was at a party um, a couple of years ago, um, was talking to somebody who was saying some things that were not like quite politically correct, um, but one of my white friends just happened to like lean over at a break in the conversation and just was like, are you good? And it just, it took like less than five seconds, but like in those five seconds, she told me that she was aware of what was going on, knew that I was uncomfortable. I was prepared to tap in if I needed her to, but she wasn't going to do that like without my consent. Like she wasn't trying to like, you know, interject herself and like save me. Um, and I was like, I'm good, but thank you. And just like that recognition, like I will never forget that and how much I appreciated that and like her subtlety in that moment. Right, and that's really difficult. It's a fine line because even in your efforts to try being a co-conspirator, that could lead to that territory of saviorism so it's really hard to navigate and to really gauge when to step in and then when to step out. So mm -hmm. I, I know it's difficult for, for some folks. But yeah, let's let's talk about your book. We got to talk about your book. Start Here, Start Now, uh, which is a book that every school district needs. If we're serious about anti-bias, anti-racist work, you can't do it without this book. And that's facts. Thank you. So, <laughs> gotta put that plug in there. Cause I know you're humble, you're down to earth. So I'm, I'm gonna do that for you. I'm gonna plug for you. Thank you, I appreciate that's, it. That's what we do, that's what we do. But talk to me about what inspired you to, to write Start Here, Start Now, and just the overall process, because I know it took a couple of years to get the book to finality. And there was a lot of twists and turns along the way. So walk us through that process and, and what do you hope that educators can gain out of this book? Also school leaders as well, because they need to read this in order to best support their um, staff in their schools. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the process took two years and maybe two years and some change. Um, was super, super proud and so privileged to work with Holly Kim Price from Heinemann. She is such an amazing editor and just like all around human. I love her so much. Um, but I guess like the inspiration originally came from a lot of the work that I was sharing on Instagram. Like I had, I think it was probably 20, 2015. Oh, I can't remember the year exactly. Um, but I, for, for a very long time, had just been sharing examples of like lessons and units and um, like anchor charts that I was co-creating with my class, um, like on Facebook or Instagram and realized like, oh, I should maybe like compartmentalize this and put this in like one place instead. And maybe if I start like a new account, then I could connect with other like-minded educators too, because I don't know a whole lot who are really focusing on social justice work at the time. I guess this was like 2015 or so at the time. It was definitely before the election. Um, and um, the more that I was sharing, I had other teachers and folks reaching out just being like, you know, how did you do this? Or, you know, I'm trying to do similar work, but I'm like running into these issues. Um, and I wanted this book to be something very usable, like very user friendly, very relevant um, for teachers, for educators. Um, so I actually asked on like Instagram stories just for folks to respond to the question, if you wanna be doing this type of work in your classroom, but you're not, why are you not? Um, and got like hundreds of responses from teachers all over the place um, and saw there are a lot of common themes in the responses of what like perceived barriers um, they were confronted with that were, you know, keeping them from engaging in this type of work with their students or in their schools. Um, and so the most common responses form actually the themes of the different chapters in the book. Because um, again, like I really wanted it to be responsive to the educational community out there. So everything you see around like 
I teach kids who are really young, what does this look like to, you know, I'm just so um, busy during the day. Like all of my minutes are like already um, like mandated by my administration or my district or, you know, I teach math and science and like, what the heck does this look like in a STEM classroom? Um, so all of those themes came directly from teachers. So yeah, it, it's it's been a lot, but um, so far it's been, I think like well-received and it's been incredibly uh, validating to see the book in the hands of teachers from all over the place and to, you know, get tagged in posts about how different teachers and different communities are using it. And I, I hope it helps. Yeah. <laughs> well, I believe, and I'm not someone that believes that there's such a, a thing as perfection. I do believe that we can get as close to perfection as possible, but this book is pretty close to it because I think about a lot of the professional development sessions that we go to as educators. And usually what happens is there's a subgroup of staff members who feel like the PD is resonating with them. And then you have another group that feels like, oh, this doesn't really relate to me. Mm -hmm. But the way you wrote the book, you really made an intentional effort to be inclusive of all the different groups. So you mentioned STEM teachers. Uh, you mentioned what it means to engage in developmentally appropriate ad bar work because the reality is sometimes if you're teaching early childhood, we believe that uh, they might be too young to understand what's going on around our world. So let's wait until they get a little bit older mm -hmm. before we really have some candid conversations about the world around us but you tackle that. And I think that's that's what makes the book so powerful because I don't feel like there's any group, there's any student, there's any like subgroup of people who are left out. Even our stakeholders, our parents, they're included in the book. I mean. <laughs> Thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, there are definitely parts, I think I like went over on my word count too, like we took out a whole chapter and like kind of dispersed it into other parts of the book because um, there wasn't enough space. But there, were, I had meant to have one extra chapter, um, not extra, but just one more chapter in the text about what ABAR work can look like when you're working with students with disabilities and had done some really fantastic interviews with um, teachers who focus on working with kids with disabilities and just found that while I had taken classes, have had students with IEPs in my class every year I've been a teacher. It was just not my area of expertise and realizing like, I think I need to stay in my lane for this one. I think this would be a fantastic text for someone with like a different background or different identity or expertise to write instead. Um, so I hope at some point somebody writes that book too. And I actually had, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Jen Newton and Mira Cole Williams. So they are teachers intellectual on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually had them on the podcast a couple months ago for a conversation about um, ableism and how it shows up in our schools. How does it intertwine with um, racism and, and even these recent talks about critical race theory, which we know is really not about that. It's about the other CRTs as well and all these other things. But that's another conversation that I'm not even going to get into because everybody else has been talking about it. And yeah, but um, when you when I look at just how ableism shows up, I mean, I was somebody who was in special education as a child my first four years. So pretty much my whole elementary school career, you know, I was in a self-contained uh, special education classroom. And then when I became a teacher, I had students who had IEPs, I had students who had 504 plans. I also had autis students who have autism as well because I taught in a school that had a ASD program where we had a lot of students with autism and you know, we learned how to de-escalate situations, um, how to teach them, how to differentiate instruction. So we had a lot of extensive training around that. But even with all of that, 
I'm far from an expert, so I'll be interested in seeing that book get written. I'm sure it's going to be written at some point because there's a lot of publications out there already with regards yeah, to this. Absolutely. And I also hope it's written by somebody who is part of the disabled community too, because I realize that like I can also, you know, educate myself um, and share information about ableism, but being a person who is not disabled, I'm still intellectualizing that perspective, that history, that identity. Um, and I know that the majority of texts that I have read about special education and working with students with disabilities has been written by folks who are non-disabled, folks who are neurotypical. And to realize that this is actually still a form of like white supremacy culture of paternalism, assuming that um, disabled folks are not capable of, you know, speaking for themselves or like writing about their own experiences or how to best support students um, who share these identities. So I also hope to see that shift in this field as well. Uh, for sure. And even that paternalism, that's just a form of saviorism as well, because it's like, okay, we, we have the best of intentions. We know what's best for this marginalized group. So let us be the voice for them without actually giving them the chance to voice what their experiences are. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have that, that power horde and that also happens as well. You know, so it, there's a lot going on there within that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot. So right now there's a lot, there's a lot of things going on in our nation. So we know about the bans on critical race theory. We know there's a lot going on with COVID-19 and this new Delta variant that's ravaging so many different communities. But I, I want to talk about heteronormativity for a second, because I think what's been lost is the fact that there's an attack on trans people throughout our country and other folks within the LGBTQ plus community. Um, right now, currently, you have over 100 anti-trans bills that are being pushed through different state legislatures across the country. So I know, you know, with you, you know, being bisexual and, you know, being very transparent about that, I'm interested in knowing your thoughts about what we can do to create queer affirming spaces within our schools and how do we combat heteronormativity from a policy perspective, from a rules perspective and and also from a curricular perspective uh because we there's so many areas in which we have to combat this uh within our own communities yes that is so true and i will also say that despite identifying as bisexual i'm still a cisgender woman um i think i've been able to work with to learn from um, friends who are also educators, activists who identify as trans and non-binary and also to follow, try to follow their lead also and what they're suggesting that we can do to make schools more inclusive for um, students across the queer spectrum too. Um, I think one of the first things that we can do is to really uh, focus in on the assumptions that we make about our students and the types of labeling that exist in schools. Um, if it is bathrooms, if it is around like Mother's Day or Father's Day, um, the school that I went to had like a, like a mother daughter show senior year. And there was like a father daughter brunch, um, just like a lot of like traditions that were very gendered um, and also like very exclusive too. Um, so to think first about how like we can address students in a way that is affirming and inclusive, um, regardless of how students might identify based on their gender. Um, to look, take a look at our curriculum as well, to think about um, what types of identities, families, relationships are being centered in our stories. Um, so I know a, a huge argument by like the more uh, conservative community in education will say things like, you know, this just isn't, you know, it's not appropriate to have like queer relationships centered, centered in picture books or in curriculum, but you're still 
making a huge statement when you might have books or stories or curriculum that focus on relationships that happen to be like heterosexual or heteronormative um, because you're telling students that like this type of love, romance, marriage, even friendship, identity um, can be normalized in a way that inherently marginalizes students who might not identify that way too. Um, I think um, something that I have learned a lot about from my friend Nate Schwartz, my friend Sky Tooley, um, is really thinking about the ways that we're inviting students to share who they are in our classrooms too, and to recognize that not everybody might be ready or willing, even if they do identify as trans or non-binary, to share, for example, like what their pronouns are with their community. Um, but to at least give folks the option, and if you are in a position of privilege to also model for yourself um, that this is a part of who you are that you're willing to share to therefore invite other people to share as well. Um, honestly, like there are, there are so many books that have been written about this. I feel like I'm not doing this question justice at all. And I think to, I think about how we're affirming who kids are, how we invite kids to express who they are, how we invite staff members, adults, caregivers in our communities too, to think about who is being centered, what types of identities and perspectives. Um, and of course, like, with queer affirming spaces as well as like anti-racist spaces to make sure that you're cultivating this cult, um, like a culture in our environments in which people understand accountability, understand like calling in when harm is being done and for folks to be open to feedback in order to improve and make a place better, safer, more inclusive for everybody. And it goes back to what you said about paternalism where as a teacher, you want to do what's best for your students. You're thinking about your students' best interest. But, you know, at the same time, you have to provide space for your students to give you that constructive feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Where they can call you in and say, hey, you know, Mrs. Sarfo Mensa, you know, uh, you probably should have said it this way without mm -hmm. you feeling offended, right? And I mean, and that's something that is a a process because growing up, you know, we saw a lot of teachers just coming in, being the ones that know everything, and we're the ones that we have to that have to gain that knowledge. So it's what uh, Paulo Freire talks about with the banking method, where okay, y'all know anything, y'all just sit here gain this knowledge from this teacher. You're gonna get all your answers from the teacher. And that's how you're going to learn. It's not this symbiotic relationship that happens between teacher and student that uh, we try to do now when we talk about having a student-centered uh, culture within our classrooms. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, what was I gonna say? It is late, y'all. But let me get my train of thought. Yes. And um, with regard to just your own journey as an ABAR educator, I'm interested in knowing in what ways have you personally evolved in this work from the time that you start to engage with it up until now? And how do you continue to evolve? Because, and I think this is an important question because I feel like you have a lot of people particularly on social media, who believe that because you, you know, write books and articles about it and you engage in this work uh, very actively and intentionally that you just know everything there is to know, but you're someone that's been always very humble and transparent about your own journey and the fact that you are still a work in progress and you still make mistakes along the way and you try to grow. So I'm just interested in knowing how you've made ways to evolve in this journey? Yeah, I think something as simple as like looking at the list of social identifiers and realizing like there are a lot on here that I know nothing about. And even within like the field of anti-racism, um, making sure that I'm also not continuing to perpetuate that anti-racism only exists along this black white binary too. Um, and that also means that I need to be educating myself listening, learning, reading, um, 
from folks who share very different perspectives and very different histories and identities than I do. And yes, like it can feel very overwhelming, but I actually think that social media, even though it can be quite a dumpster fire, um, is also just a really amazing tool to be able to learn from folks in like smaller, like bite-sized pieces often. Um, and I know like for, for educators who want to, I think, quite often like want to have the answer to everything or just always be prepared um, to recognize that it's so important to try to let go of those feelings of needing to like be in control all the time, um, which is certainly a place um, that I think that I've made some progress in in my career over the years. Um, but again, just trying to identify like those awareness gaps, like in my own knowledge and understanding and thinking about what I can do to educate myself that also is not going to create additional labor for people who I love and people I care about. Um, like for example, this, I would say over the past like year or two, um, disability is one area that I've tried to educate myself about a lot more, um, but also body inclusivity too. Um, being like a, a straight sized person, Meaning that like I can walk into like any, you know, like mainstream clothing store, department store and find something that fits me. Um, I know very little about the identities of fat folks and what their lived experience is like and the type of oppression and discrimination they face. And so that's been a place where I've been trying to do a lot more listening and learning into thinking about how I can take that knowledge and understanding to try to create an even more inclusive environment in the school where I'm working or for different companies or organizations that I might be consulting with. Um, but just to, uh, I think like in the world of like marginalization, trying to make those margins like um, a little bit smaller as much as I can. And you're only one person. And when we talk about engaging this work, it, it takes collective hands to do this. This is not, you know, work for the solo. Like you need a team, a team of people um, across the board, you know, racially, culturally, socioeconomically, we, we all have to engage in this work. It can't just be done alone mm -hmm. because that leads to the burnout that, you know, we talked about earlier. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> all right. So we can talk about this all night, but I want to get things light now. So let's get into the lightning round so folks can get to know more about Liz outside of this heavy work. Because we have to humanize our educators. We don't just live in the classroom. <laughs> we, don't, we don't just put out tweets and stay in front of our screens trying to extinguish fires as some people may perceive, we have mm -hmm. lives too. So we want to get to know a little bit about you outside this work. So um, the first question I want to ask you is this, what's your favorite self-care activity right now? Exercising. Um, I find it's my favorite way to like release stress. And when I'm like the most stressed, I tend to realize like, oh, I haven't done anything active lately. Cool, time to get outside. All right. Uh, a book that you're currently reading? Um, I just started reading We're Not Broken, um, which is actually about autism, written by somebody who is autistic, um, written by Eric Garcia. I'm not super far into the book, but it's been really interesting so far. A song that gets you hype for teaching? I don't know if I need a song necessarily that's going to get me hyped. Usually I need a song that's going to like chill me out and I'm super anxious about teaching. Um, I feel like my go-to song for all things like that, though, is a Lovely Day by Bill Withers. It just like is grounding in such a lovely song. Oh, it puts me in a good mood. It just like reminds me that everything is going to be all good. <laughs> oh, you know, I love karaoke. So that's one of my that's one of my songs. It's a great one. In the morning, love. And the sunlight hurts my eyes. That's all y'all gonna get. That's all y'all gonna get. <laughs> but when he when he hits that lovely day, and he just extends that day part, he holds it for I so to, long. <laughs> I try to get to the end, and I can never hold my breath long enough to get there. I can't. I don't have the breath control for that. <laughs> 
All right. Um, I know you're big on horror movies. Um, I grew up in the Freddy Krueger, Child's Play, Friday the 13th <laughs> era. So that's my era of scary movies. And, mm -hmm. and I don't really watch them like that, but I know you're big on it. So I want to know your top five favorite horror movies. That's so hard. Oh, gosh. OK. Um, I think that majority of what James Wan has directed in the horror universe, um, like all of those could be counted. He did like The Conjuring, did Insidious, like Annabelle, all of those. Um, and I'm just so impressed at how all of those films like fit together within the universe that he's created. So that would be one. Um, Jaws um, scared the crap out of me as a kid. I love that movie so much. Um, what else? Um, Mothman Prophecies also scared me a ton. Like older movie, I think it was like in the 90s with like Richard Gere and like Laura Linney. Um, I really love that movie too. Um, there is a Korean movie called Phone, um, which I also found particularly terrifying. It's like a ghost story, but I really like the twist at the end of it. I thought that was really good also. Um, and recently watched actually an Orthodox Jewish horror film called The Vigil, um, which was really, really creepy and really good. Awesome. And then if you're at dinner and you can invite three influential figures, dead or alive, who would they be? Oh, that's so hard. Um, I think two of them I would want to invite are Yori Kuchiyama and Malcolm X. I would love to just talk. I mean, Yori Kuchiyama is uh, like an Asian American role model of mine. She's incredible. Um, but I think not very many people know that she and Malcolm X were friends. And I think like, unfortunately in this work, you don't see a lot of mainstream examples of like interracial solidarity. So I just love to talk to them about like their work, um, how they saw their identities, like their activism influencing and like being intertwined with each other. Um, and I'm just also going to add in Michelle Obama in there because I really love her. And I feel like she could really add a lot to that conversation too. Yeah, Michelle Obama. Matter of fact, <laughs> the Obamas in general are popular choices at the table <laughs> on this podcast. So you're not, you're far from the first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Liz, Thank you so much for being on the podcast. This has been an incredible conversation. And, you know, I wish we had more time, but I know it's a Sunday and we we'll want to make sure that you have some time to decompress because I know you have a new week coming up with school. Oh, don't remind me. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just being a realist here. <laughs> uh, but before you go, if you can let folks know how they can reach out to you on social media, and you could also share um, your website as well for folks who may, for schools who may want to engage in um, some consultant work with you and collaborate. Sure. Um, so I am the most active on Instagram. Um, my handle is at teach and transform. Um, I am getting a little bit more consistent on Twitter where my handle is very similar. It's teach n like the letter n transform because like whole the and like put me over the character count. Um, I have a website, teachandtransform.org, and through there you can order my book. I ask folks if you are able to, to order it through Heinemann, my publisher, not through Amazon. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you. And also I have a Patreon community. If you go to patreon.com, um, if you enter my name or teach and transform, you can join our community where that's the place where if you send me a message, I will always respond to your message and answer your question or hook your resources or whatever you need, or even do like individual coaching if that's what um, you need. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of different options to get in touch and just really appreciate folks for spending their free time to either watch or listen. Thank you. And thank you so much, Kwame, for having me on. Yes, and thank you, Liz, again. So y'all heard it. Let's do this work, y'all. Let's do this work. She already told y'all she don't got all the answers, so stop bugging her on social media, <laughs> trying to get answers from her. Go look for those answers yourself, all right? Let's do the work. Let's be proactive, y'all. So. 
Thank you, Liz. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. All right, y'all. So we're about to end another episode of our Dane Talk Educators Live. And as always, I wish you all a good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody. Thank you.